Good afternoon and welcome everybody. Um, this is the um, inaugural talk in the Applied Computational Sciences um, Distinguished Lecture Series. And um, I have today the great pleasure to introduce Kathy Yelik, uh, who will be giving this talk. Um, Kathy is the Executive Associate Dean in the Division of Computing, Data Science and Society. And she's also the Robert Pepper Distinguished Professor of Electrical Engineering and Computer Sciences at the University of California, uh, Berkeley. And along with her professorship at Berkeley, she's also a senior faculty scientist at the Lawrence Berkeley National um, Lab. Um, Kathy has been doing some pioneering work in high performance computing, in programming systems, in parallel algorithms. And she has worked also in computational genomics, and she actually currently leads the Exabiome project on solutions for microbiome alliance, um, analysis. She received her PhD in electrical engineering and computer science, uh, as we say here, down from MIT. And she has been a professor at UC Berkeley since 1991 um, and at the Berkeley Lab since 1996. Uh, Kathy was the director of the National Energy Research Scientific Computing Center from 2008 to 2012, and she led the computing science area at Berkeley Lab from 2010 to 2019, where she oversaw the um, NERSC and the Energy Sciences Network and the Computational Research Department. Kathy is a member of the National Academy of Engineering and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She is a fellow of the Association for Computing Machinery and the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences. And she's also the recipient of the ICM IEEE, IEEE Ken Kennedy Award and the ICM W Athena Award. Uh, Kathy, we are super excited and cool to have you here inaugurating the series. And I will um, leave the floor to you. We are very much looking forward to your talk. Great. Well, thanks very much, Petros, and thanks for the committee, I guess, for inviting me or all of you. Um, I'm really happy to be here. I, I would be even happier, actually, to be there with you in Cambridge. I was hoping to be out there and maybe have a chance to row on the Charles River, which I did uh, almost every day while I was an undergrad and, uh, and for many years after that as a grad student. So I certainly miss the... Uh, the Charles River. Um, I'm going to talk today about machine learning in science and um, give you a little bit of pretty high level perspective on the applications, algorithms and architectures. Um, I'll do a little bit of a shameless advertising of my own research kind of woven throughout on uh, microbial research as one of the kind of ongoing examples and especially when you get into the algorithm space. So um, I'm going to talk about sort of what, um, why, how, and where we're using machine learning in science. Um, so just to start with is a slide from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and all of the different applications of machine machine learning and science, or many of them at least. Um, there's a website here for your reference, but you can see a very diverse set of applications from applied energy applications, such as controlling building energies to very fundamental science, nuclear science, particle physics, high energy physics, um, and so on. So across, across a really wide range of disciplines. And I, you know, I try to sort of step back and think about what are the general things that we're doing with machine learning and science. And I think it roughly falls into three categories. And that's probably true whether we were talking about scientific applications or others. We're using it a lot to analyze data. We're also using it to um, accelerate various kinds of problems that we're trying to solve, whether it's something like the design of new materials. Um, or other sorts of uh, inverse kind of uh, problems. And we're also using it to automate various processes. Some of the experiments that we're, we're doing have robotics, but also using it more generally to automate things like the set of simulations that you're going to run. So to start with um, analyzing the, um, uh, you know, some examples of analysis here. There's um, a, uh, the, the canonical example of finding cats on the internet. And of course we can use this for classifying whether an image contains a cat, localizing where the cat is in the image, detecting other sorts of things that are sort of like cats, but not exactly, and segmenting exactly what, what is the outline of them in that, in any particular image. And so the, uh, the 
analogy in science is some work um, that's done here. And of course, there are many, many applications of this throughout scientific disciplines. But this is looking at analysis of simulation data to find hurricanes or other extreme climate events. So the first question is, in a simulation, is there a hurricane? Where is it? Uh, can you detect other sorts of things like an atmospheric river as well as the hurricanes? And um, can you do segmentation? Can you identify? Can you uh, really provide an outline around where the um, where the the extreme climate event is? And it, it can, you can you learn both the particulars of the. Um, of, of, a, a, of the um, number of hurricanes, you count them. I thought originally, well, why would you need to count something or automate something as extreme as these sorts of climate events, such as a hurricane? But the answer is if you're running many different scenarios for hundreds of years to try to detect whether climate, whether global warming is going to in, lead to increased number and intensity of hurricanes, you really want some tools for automating it. It turns out the machine learning algorithms have actually proven to be more accurate than the types of of kind of parameterized techniques that they were using before. Um, in looking at high energy physics, it, it, this is also used in a number of different, uh, say, these particle physics applications at the Large Hadron Collider, such as looking for the Higgs boson. And um, the idea of fairness comes up even in these very fundamental physics questions. Now, I think some of the solutions are not going to be the same here, because, uh, but, but you're looking for algorithmic bias and, and ways of eliminating that bias in um, trying to extract signals from very noisy data sets. And maybe a more even kind of easier to see example is something like telescope data. If you've got a telescope in the Northern hemisphere versus the Southern hemisphere, it's going to be biased in a certain way in terms of how it's collecting images. And so the algorithms need to correct for that, or you need to combine data sets in a, in a, in a smart way in order to uh, try to eliminate those kinds of biases that come from the instruments or their placement. And even natural language processing, which may not seem like it's so applicable to scientific disciplines, comes up in analyzing scientific publications. Uh, this is a, a, some work that's related to the materials project at Berkeley, uh, UC Berkeley and Lawrence Berkeley Lab. And it's really showing that you can actually reconstruct parts of the periodic table by looking at, by doing natural language processing on scientific publications. So they analyzed over 3 million abstracts um, from the uh, from papers in order to do this work. Now this next example, and I think I may have forgotten to turn on my uh, sound, so you may not hear the sound, but is looking at um, using generative adversarial neural nets to do things like produce fake videos or fake, uh, you know, I'm sure you've seen all the fake images. So let's see if this video will work. So there's our ballet dancer and two graduate students who actually don't know how to dance very well. Um, but now this is actually making them appear to know how to dance by superimposing their images on this um, a model that's learned from an expert. All right, so where does this come up in science? It may not seem like it's very useful to produce fake data uh, when you're studying scientific problems, but it turns out that these generative adversarial neural nets, some of the similar kinds of techniques are being used to generate things like these convergence maps of weak gravitational lensing. So I'm using them to try to understand physical laws. And um, I will say that there's a lot of, I think, a debate in this area about when, they, when you can rely and trust these kinds of models. Models, and that's one of the things that I think is very valuable about having scientists looking at these problems is bringing a level of rigor to them when you're just trying to make sort of realistic looking videos, you may not care so much about some of these more statistical and kind of provable properties of them. Um, but using these kinds of techniques also for generating potential solutions to problems such as materials problems, drug design, and things like that, and using methods that um, have to search through this enormous space of possible solutions. And in this particular work, they're, look, they're looking at a method that is um, trying to balance between looking at things near the training data set where you have high confidence and looking things that are, if you only look, say, under the under the street lamp, then you're not really going to see potentially some of the best solutions. And so trying to balance those things that, that you have high confidence in with other parts of the search space that you also need to explore, but will be further away from the training data. <laughs> 
And another issue that comes up in these kinds of problems, um, in particular in materials problems, are looking at um, understanding the physics constraints on the problem. So for example, a molecular structure that's invariant over the three-dimensional rotations, you can train a neural net in this case to, and these Tetris shapes and all of their different orientations to basically train the neural net that these uh, molecules should be invariant, even if you're looking at a, a two-dimensional image of it, that they're invariant over three-dimensional rotations. So that's trying to put some physics, kind of build the physics into the models, if you will. Now in the automation space, um, of course, the most kind of popular example that we hear a lot about is um, self-driving cars. Um, this comes up in what we oft sometimes term self-driving laboratories, where you do have robotics. Sometimes people talk about lab in the cloud, where you've got biology labs and things like that, that are, that can be remotely, that are sort of independent and remote entities that you're using for some of your experimental research. And um, so controlling these kinds of systems and also controlling the experimental instruments that are in some sense too, um, they're, they're too fine. The control needs to be con controlled so finely that it's not really something that is very, uh, that human hands are very adept at. And we, we look at this across the different user facilities across the Department of Energy labs, the DOE labs, and um, as a way of automating the different experimental facilities by combining them with the supercomputing facilities and um, sending the data automatically across a high speed network such as ESnet in order to get things from these um, large experiments such as the advanced light sources, genome sequencers, telescopes, particle detectors, and so on into the supercomputers. And that's related to the fact that the data sets have grown so quickly and the data rates have grown so quickly that it's hard to build enough computing at each one of the sites. And in fact, DOE pushed back on the idea that we're going to build essentially a, a, a supercomputing center at each one of the experimental facilities because their, their computational needs had grown along with the data rates. Now, you may think that edge computing seems like it's something that is really not relevant to science, but in fact, um, putting, placing environmental sensors around and um, in the, in, for measuring various things, whether it's weather sensors or other aspects, you know, videos and things like that for looking for particular things in the environment also comes up. And so then you have the, the problem of streaming real-time data into these um, supercomputing facilities as well. In the case of the large experiments, you may be able to make a reservation in advance that says, I'm going to do this experiment at a certain period of time. In the case of environmental sensors, you probably have more of a continuous need for that type of computing access. So just to sort of summarize some of the things that we see that I think are not necessarily unique to science, but are really emphasized in the scientific domain are problems such as physics aware learning, um, looking at interpretability. So we really care that the in, if you're trying to use machine learning to build mechanistic models, that we can really interpret the results of those models. It's not just a black box with a million parameters in it in which we can't make any sense of exactly why it's learning particular things. Using it for inverse design um, using it for transfer learning can also come up where uh, we're, we're looking at cases where you, you have designed a learning algorithm and a model for a particular detector, for example, and when you upgrade that, you want to be able to take those results to another domain. Federated learning and even private learning, um, a lot of the data that we use in science, uh, in basic fundamental science is not, does not have privacy considerations. It actually is great, a great feature of a lot of that data that you don't need to worry about the privacy, even the genomic data that comes up in the, in the DOE space. And what I'll talk about with microbes, nobody really cares about the privacy of the fungus or the bacteria. Um, but certainly there are applications, especially in the applied energy space, where you have sensors around, for example, in the power grid, where you really do care about the privacy of people's electrical use, for example. Um, uncertainty quantification, really being able to get guarantees, hard mathematical guarantees about things, um, learning across different scales. Um, this comes up a lot in environmental data and looking at really complex three-dimensional data. The climate data that I talked about at the beginning is an example of that, but also very sparse data sets where sometimes you actually have a limited amount of data for the, for the model you're trying to build. 
the control of experiments I talked about and the fact that fairness, um, although it's somewhat different than in say public policy problems that we're looking at at UC Berkeley um, in, the, in the scientific kind of fundamental science domains, um, some of these fairness issues still arise in terms of adapting your or, or adjusting for biases in your data. So why is this, there a machine learning advantage? Um, why is it something that people are very excited about in science? Well, and, and I'll probably oversimplify a bit, but I'm gonna quote from um, Jeff Hinton's uh, uh, Turing Award lecture, where he said that a lot of the credit for deep learning success really goes to the people that collected the large data sets like Fei Fei Li and the people who made the computers go fast like David Patterson and others. David was sitting in the audience at the time. So I think there are many people that made computers go fast, but I think the point was, and I think many people would, would, would say this as well, that the success of deep learning is real, was really the combination of faster computers um, and also understanding how to take advantage of those computers. That is mapping things like dense matrix multiply and now narrow precision arithmetic onto these computers in order to get the kind of orders of magnitude speed up that we've gotten over the last couple of decades. Um, and the fact that we've got labeled data sets, curated data sets and very large data sets that can be used for training. And um, I'll, you know, so I don't want to understate the importance of ongoing algorithmic work in machine learning to try to improve the, the techniques in various ways, but I'm going to sort of talk now about these more of these performance issues and how we map these algorithms onto modern hardware. So the three things you need for the, the success of machine learning is big data. Um, you need, so you need a lot of data if you're going to use especially deep learning algorithms. Um, you're going to need scalable approaches that can actually take advantage of fast hardware, and you're going to need the, the uh, fast hardware that is what I'll call big iron here. So um, looking at this from in a particle of physics example and um, this is one that I just I thought was a, a nice sort of highlight of the value of machine learning and science kind of translated into the cost of the experiments, or at least the size of the experiments. This was work at the CMS experiment at the Large Hadron Collider using, and when they started using convolutional neural nets and um, a neural net based classifier on this uh, particle data, looking at these, these images, um, that it was like adding 4,000 extra tons of detector mass. So an, an incredibly powerful um, technique with uh, analyzing these very large data sets. Another example I'll just point out, which is not deep learning, and this is some work I did a, a number of years ago, was looking at scaling up other types of machine learning algorithms, in this case, inverse covariance matrix estimation. So you're looking for um, correlations or um, between or in covariance between different uh, aspects, different features of the data set and trying to understand which ones are actually important. And these kinds of algorithms were typically, uh, have typically been run on shared memory machines, um, but the graph on the right Right, is showing the performance, the running time in seconds as you grow the size of the data set, the number of features that you're looking at. And this is the, the kind of state of the art uh, was an algorithm called Big Quick, uh, which was um, which runs on shared memory machines, but didn't take advantage of distributed memory parallelism. And then our work was looking at um, what happens when you actually can run it on a distributed memory supercomputer and you can handle, you could certainly solve problem sizes that would have taken, I think if you extrapolate out and it, you couldn't run the problem on these, this larger data set for the big, big quick um, implementation that would have taken though uh, five weeks, I believe. And, um, and so it's both an issue of time and it's also an issue of the memory space. And these some of the algorithms that are underneath here rely on techniques that I'll talk about a little bit later, which are sparse matrix computations that involve um, communication avoiding techniques in order to get these techniques to scale effectively on very large systems, very large numbers of parallel processors. And then, as I said, as um, Petros mentioned, I'm running a project called Exabiome, which is looking at high performance extreme scale or exascale techniques for understanding microbial data. So you may wonder whether you know, there are data sets that are large enough um, in this genomic space that they really would justify an exascale machine. And I'll just mention a couple of examples here. Well, this is the size of the total kind of databases of uh, microbial data and a project that the Department of Energy stood up called the National Microbiome Data Collaborative, NMDC. 
And so there's our usual exponential growth rate, we, which we have for many different types of data in science and outside of science, um, but in the microbial space as well. And um, here's an example of some work that we, we did analyzing a data set with our high performance computing tools. And this is looking at genome assembly in particular, and this is a 1.5 terabyte data set, which was looking at the question of what happens to microbes after a wildfire, something that we worry about quite a lot out here in California. And um, this the, the 1.5 terabytes may not seem so large, but it grows by about an order of magnitude in the middle of the computation as you're trying to put these pieces together. And I'll say a little bit about what the computation like looks like in a minute. Another example that we just completed um, uh, this month actually was uh, a data set that comes from the freshwater lakes and was collected over a 17 year period. It's a 26 terabyte data set looking at the, the microbial species and we're in, looking for things like how these algae blooms are formed and what, what causes this, these various um, the growth of different types of data set, uh, data, uh, microbial species. So the genome assembly problem is one where you start with um, individual fragments of sequence data that come from the sequencers. Um, they are full of errors and they um, and you you read that data set multiple times so that you will be guaranteed you think at least of having a copy multiple copies of any piece of the puzzle that you're trying to put together this one's got three billion pieces this is the human genome in these microbial data sets that we're looking at um, we don't have a reference it's not as though somebody has assembled it before so we don't know what um, all, some of these bacteria have never been cultured in a lab and so there's there's no uh, reference genome for them and they're all mixed together in a sample so we'll do something like pick up a sample of soil, send it through a sequencer. The different colors here are to denote the fact that there are multiple species. There may be hundreds or even thousands of species all, all inside of this sample. We get fragments of each of the genomes of those species all mixed together in the data that comes out of the sequencer. And the assembly problem then is to try to put these together into complete genomes for each one of the different species, or at least log them enough fragments that we can do things like identified gene coding sequences, that protein coding sequences that are in the genetic data and use that to um, find, the, find the genes, find the proteins. Um, and then we are also looking at finding, um, if you've heard of the AlphaFold project using machine learning algorithms to, to understand how those proteins fold. And we're looking at using both the structure and the genome sequence data then to try to identify what function uh, those, those um, proteins have. And by using relationships with known proteins as well as other things. So this is just kind of a, a high level overview of the types of analysis. And there are opportunities for machine learning that um, all throughout this process. In fact, at the beginning, the first thing you could try to do is to try to separate the little fragments by their color, by their species, um, so that it's easier to assemble each one of them separately. That turns out to be a very hard problem. So we currently assemble them first, and then we try, then we put them into bins based on how they, how they fit together and uh, what their similarity is once we got the, have the longer fragments. And this is just an example from the assembly space um, of the value of combining these enormous multi-terabyte data sets with big iron that is, these were run on, this, this data was run on supercomputers. I believe this particular one was run on the, the Cori supercomputer at, at NERSC at the, um, at the supercomputing center at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Although the latest data sets that we've run, the 26 terabyte one is run on the Summit supercomputer at Oak Ridge National Lab, which is the, the largest um, open supercomputer in the US. And, um, and one of the fastest in the world. And what these different lines are showing is the, the length of the assembly that you're getting out. So higher is better. You want a more complete assembly. Um, and the number of contigs that we're looking at out of that, that assembly based on the, the, the length of them. And so um, what we're looking at here is comparing the um, what happens if you if you try to um, assemble each one of them separately. Uh, so that's called multi-assembly. And you could do that on a more conventional sort of assembler that would run on shared memory machines. So that orange line. And what happens is you don't get nearly as much um, kind of the, the quality of the assembly that you get out, the cumulative length, given a certain number of contigs is much lower um, that you can see comparing the blue and the orange line. The blue line, which is our work, is looking at taking all that data to get together and assembling it at once. So what you have here, excuse me, is a um, uh, 
sorry, is, is an assembly that is um, is uh, just using you know all the entire data set as one huge sample so that you have multiple more copies of each one of the parts of the different species that are put together. Um, the deduped version of the multi-assembly is uh, where after the assembly you try to remove the duplicates because what you can see here is the reference line, which is this dashed line at the top, is we're, we're in this particular case we're assembling something that has references to it. We took some known assemblies and combined them together into this data set as a an experiment to figure out whether we could re reconstruct it. And in this case, the if you separate all the pieces into things that can, are small enough to run on a shared memory machine, what you get out is actually multiple copies of things that are actually hard to then disentangle. Whereas our assembler, you can see really asymptotes to the size of that reference. So using the higher quality, the, the larger data set is actually an advantage here. Now, um, the question is, how are we going to actually use this uh, big iron for these kinds of very large scale computations? How do we use high performance parallel computing? And um, in the US, um, when and I was more involved at the lab um, up until a couple of years ago, and looking across the landscape, we were trying to figure out how one could build an exascale computer. So we had petascale computers, 10 to the 15th floating point operations per, per second, and we were looking at how to build exascale ones. And the first thing you might say is, well, let's wait for Moore's law and Denard scaling, and we would have, say, 100x faster clock rate and maybe 10x more power, a 10x larger system, and um, which would probably require at least 10, 10 times the, uh, the electrical power in order to run uh, power that system. And so that was sort of one of the options that was immediately dismissed, by the way, because we knew that we were not going to get 100x faster clock rates at that time. Denard scaling had already ended. Um, we There were already GPUs being used in some of the supercomputers, and um, that was one of the options. But the other one was to have more cores, to have smaller, um, a smaller number, sm smaller cores, simpler cores that have a lower clock rate and to get more of them. And after that was back in 2008, and looking at today, what we have are uh, three systems at the three open science labs in DOE that run supercomputing centers, the Perlmutter system that has been delivered at, at NERSC, although it's still in pre-production. That's a pre-exascale system, and it is running NVIDIA GPUs and um, AMD CPUs. And um, the, the Frontier system, which is being installed at Oak Ridge National Lab, which has AMD CPUs and AMD GPUs, and the Aurora system going into Argonne National Labs, which has Intel CPUs and Intel GPUs. So our architectural diversity that we had planned on back in 2008 actually came to nothing. And we ended up with, um, we, we have diversity across the vendor space with three different GPUs in these three different systems, um, but actually the same network, um, all from HPE, formerly that they purchased Cray, and um, different CPUs, a couple of different CPU models, but um, and three different GPU models, but not not this sort of different, really fundamentally different architectural models with a many core system like a Xeon Phi um, or an ARM core. Now, some of the other um, countries are pursuing other types of architectural models as they also tend to, to um, march towards exascale. And um, we're seeing specialization come up, of course, all over the place, and these are just some examples of the of the places where we've seen, um, you know, NVIDIA looking at build has put in deep learning features into their um, even a couple of generations ago. The Risk Five is now an open architect hardware platform developed originally at Berkeley for doing, um, but now now commercialized for uh, making open architectures where the ISA is like an open source. Um, uh, 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 intellectual property that you can that you can use. Um, ARM is another one that also is reconfigurable and or can be adapted in certain ways by adding accelerators, kind of similar to that, but um, but is not an open ISA. And of course, FPGAs give you the ability to reconfigure the hardware, um, and we're seeing things like tensor processing units. So if you look across this space, there's quite a bit of work going on in specialization. It's also the case in the supercomputing community, as I alluded to, um, if you look at the Sunway system in China, the, the, um, the Fugaku system in Japan, or some, and look at the strategy in Europe, uh, the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, all of them are looking at these uh, other sorts of uh, many core with specialized accelerators attached to them uh, approach as opposed to the GPU approach. And of course, there's a tremendous um, landscape of 
hardware um, in the AI chip landscape space. So these are just uh, some of the logos from the, the many large and small startup companies that are involved in, the, in developing new chips for AI. And I think my one comment on this, I will call a cautionary tale from the high-performance Linpack or HPL benchmark. Um, the, if you're familiar with the top 500 list, it uses the high-performance Linpack benchmark, dense linear algebra, so dense LU factorization as a benchmark for scientific computing. Now, 25 years ago, maybe dense LU factorization was not such a bad benchmark for what a lot of scientific computations were doing. Um, certainly as the problem scale, the computation scale, that's an order n cubed algorithm, uh, people quickly started using sparse methods and adaptive methods and things like that. Um, and the, But the benchmark stayed. And it's still an interesting benchmark. It gives you a nice history of what has happened over the years. What I'm worried about in this AI space is that everybody, there's so much focus on a, a pretty small class of applications in this machine learning AI space, um, in particular for convolutional neural nets and deep neural nets. And I do realize some of them are looking more at, at some of these other kinds of computations now, but there's, there's maybe a little bit too much focus and I'm worried that we don't have enough diversity in the architectural space. This is a picture, by the way, of the, the TPU system at Google. And of course, the other interesting thing, and I'll come back to this at the end, is that um, you can't buy them, right? These are not chips that you can go and buy and configure your own cluster with. You can only get access to them through their, through their um, commercial cloud offerings. So um, that was a little bit about what's going on in the processor space and, and what you'll see from that and, the, and what was maybe most significant to me personally as the lead of the Exabiome project. We expected these genomic computations to be run on some kind of a many core architecture, such as a next generation of a, a Knight's Landing uh, sort of processor and instead are really focused on running on the, them on GPUs. We were not sure that we could run them effectively on GPUs and have been surprised by that. Um, so I'll say a little bit about how that works. But the other point um, that, and I'm sure many of you are aware of this, is if you look at the historical trends in the performance of processors um, versus network speed and memory speed, there's an enormous gap between the cost of um, any kind of data movement and the cost of any kind of computation. And that gap has been growing over the years, in spite of the fact that Denard's scaling ended, we still get more, more cores on the chip. So the flop rate of those systems has been going up. And I think that, um, and so this the issue is that we are optimizing almost entirely for communication throughout uh, everything that we're doing and running these, certainly at a large scale, but even on a single node uh, that the, the memory issues are tend to dominate the, uh, the algorithmic, the parallel kind of and performance algorithm part of the space. So rather than trying to describe the applications in, in entirety, which I certainly don't have time to do right now, um, I think it's useful, and, and this is very useful for computer scientists who might be trying to, uh, to design hardware or trying to design programming systems, compilers, um, libraries, and other tools for scientists to understand what are the important computational patterns that dominate um, the, and the important algorithms that dominate the computations. And uh, many years ago, Phil Colella, who was um, at Berkeley Lab, had coined the phrase the seven dwarfs of simulation, identifying things like particle methods, structured and unstructured meshes, dense and sparse linear algebra, spectral methods such as FFTs, and Monte Carlo methods as the um, seven sort of patterns that come up with respect to parallel, parallelism. And um, and then uh, now probably almost uh, 10 years ago, maybe maybe eight years ago, there was a National Academies report on the seven giants of big data, not wanting to be outdone. They named there's the seven giants. And these are the patterns that come up in large scale data problems. And they were, they were combining both machine learning techniques and other more traditional sort of data analytics techniques. And their list to me, I think the thing that was most surprising is how similar it was to the simulation. So there's what they call generalized and body methods. Um, now, graph theory algorithms and unstructured meshes have a lot of distinctions in terms of the kind of the way you look at that, but they're nevertheless um, these sort of uh, um, irregular graph problems. Linear algebra only got a single line, although certainly both dense and sparse algorithms come up. They had optimization and integration algorithms, as well as kind of things like string alignment algorithms um, that tend to look a little bit like um, stencil computations on structured meshes. And then there, the, there's kind of a catch-all category at the bottom, which is things that are done independently and from a parallelism standpoint are a little bit less 
uh, less um, significant, but um, but certainly very important from a machine learning and algorithmic standpoint, but not from the, the standpoint of how we're going to parallelize these codes. Now we've looked at this across the genomics applications and exabiome, and I think I would actually replace the optimization and um, integration with sorting and hashing. Those are really key building blocks of so much of what we do in analyzing large-scale genomic data and um, and then try, trying to understand how you're going to parallelize especially things like hashing hash tables and and um, counting algorithms and things like that becomes very important and it's not that i don't think that um, optimization is important it's that it's a little bit higher level algorithm as opposed to being one of the kind of fundamental building blocks that are useful um, for for understanding how you might want to design hardware or low level uh, programming techniques and things. So um, in the in the Exabiome project, um, I've been working closely with Aiden Bulich, who's a, a scientist also at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, and he's worked for a number of years on taking parallel computations and turning them into sparse matrix algorithms. I, on the other hand, have been working for many years on um, taking sparse matrix, uh, sorry, taking parallel computations and programming them sort of in a shared memory style using a partition global address space language and um, where you, you spread the computation out over a, a number of different nodes, but any one of those processors can directly read and write the memory of another node. And they lead to two very different algorithmic styles. On the left-hand side, a bulk synchronous style. On the right-hand side, a much more asynchronous style. And they're getting at different approaches for dealing with the, the communication costs of these algorithms. On the bulk synchronous side, you optimize for latency by reducing the number of messages. You pack data together in order to send fewer messages. And then you reduce the span of, say, a, a computation rather than using a linear time, say, broadcast algorithm, you'll use logarithmic algorithms. And those algorithms tend to fit very well in the bulk synchronous model because you're going to kind of wait until you're ready to do a big, huge uh, communication and, and then do it as a single step, which can be optimized that way. On the other hand, on the in the partition global address space side, um, we look at overlap rather than looking at some of these, um, these, these kind of aggregation algorithms. You actually try to send more, more messages more frequently, and that means that you need to really have very low communication overhead. And th that what that leads to on the bandwidth side is basically trying to keep all the wires busy all of the time. Whereas in the bulk synchronous side, you tend to end up with communication phases and computation phases. And so there's other trade-offs that come up here. And I, and I don't mean in any way to say that you can't use the bulk synchronous approach in the partition global address based languages or the asynchronous approaches in the, in the more bulk synchronous kind of programming model. And um, I think what my conclusion, sorry, um, at the moment is that the bulk synchronous model is still a very elegant way of expressing the algorithms. You may want to execute them, though, much more asynchronously. So we're building a sparse matrix library that is going to try to keep all the wires busy all the time, send smaller messages so that you can keep the wires busy and um, basically keep the machine uh, fully occupied. So I'll just give um, in the, a couple of examples of this. So talk about um, one of these seven motifs of data, uh, the hashing example, which comes up a lot all over the place in genomics. So we tend to do things like compute a hash table of k-mers. K-mers are fixed length strings, strings. So here we've got our three mers. We'll build a hash table of those. That hash table might just be used as a counting uh, table. So it may just be something like a quotient filter or a counting, um, just a, a data structure to keep track of the, the frequency frequency of cameras. We use that, for example, to throw out all the singletons because a singleton is most likely an error that was introduced from the, uh, the sequencing process itself. And then end, end up only with the cameras that are that have multiple copies, those are that you have much higher confidence in. And we build these hash tables. Now, it may not seem like, at least it didn't seem to me that building hash tables was a good fit for GPUs and also that, that it wasn't a good fit for distributed memory. And certainly most of the assemblers for this reason are doing things on shared memory machines and are not many, most of them are not using GPUs. So we build these table, these hash tables in distributed memory using things like a remote put and get operations, remote atomic operations, and, um, and RPC operations. And here's just some performance results showing that the 
um, bulk synchronous MPI version, which is what we started with um, and was uh, actually written by Iden and was a well-optimized code. It had bloom filters in it, which was important for keeping our memory utilization um, uh, kind of under check. And um, because you have all these singletons that you don't really care about. And then the, optimize, the, the version that's written in more of the asynchronous PGAS style is, as you can see here, significantly faster. That's the, um, the red one that we also, it, it actually is faster still if you turn off the bloom filter we're looking at now, that's because there's a completely separate communication and computation phase for building the bloom filter and then for building the hash table after that. We are looking at different counting data structures that are exact so that we can actually build them at a single point in time so it's with a single phase. Um, now, mapping this onto GPUs was also not something obvious to me, although there are people, um, and we've been doing some work with John Owens at UC Davis, looking at things like how you map these irregular computations onto GPUs. And this is some work that was done um, by one of our postdocs, um, Isra Nisra, looking at um, turning this camera counting problem, uh, putting it on a GPU. And what you're seeing here on the left is the time breakdown for the um, for the uh, CPU-based implementation, which was in, which was dominated by the the computational phases. Now they may have been memory cost as well as computation cost, but not by the exchange, which was the uh, this was a bulk synchronous version of a code. This was an MPI call to do the all to all exchanges when you're trying to count these things. So you've got this big hash table or counting data structure spread out all over over all the processors. Most of the time was actually spent in local work in the CPU version. This is the GPU version, and this red piece here is actually the same size and in terms of the because because the y axes are so different here as the original one everything else has shrunk and um, so and there's a lot of things built into this there's clever hashing functions to give you better locality so that you can you're going to likely put this the nearby pieces nearby cameras um, in the final assembly on the and also in the inputs on the same processor that reduces sort of the number of different processors you're communicating with in a different in a particular period of time and also then you take it kind of take advantage of compression or what are called super MERS, where if they are actually all contiguous in a string you can you can pack those um, you can use the more compressed version of the original input data and so that reduces both the number of messages and the um, data volume so and these were important for getting that kind of performance but the gpu here and i'll just um, kind of say tongue in cheek that the, uh, you know, we often refer to a GPU as a device that turns a compute bound problem into a communication bound problem. And that certainly is the case here in Kamer County. Generalized and body, what do I mean by that? It is a phrase that other people have used, but it's really looking at this kind of all to all computation. So if you think of a, of a naive sort of end body problem and how you might parallelize that. So here we let's say we've just got particles and we're looking at all the forces between all pairs of particles. The obvious way to parallelize a computation like this is to take the particles and then divide them up over, in this case, the eight processors of each of the different colors. So we've got 16 particles, of course, a really tiny number of particles, and we divide them up over the eight processors. And then you just pass the particle, the other particles around so that all the interaction, interactions can be computed. It turns out that that is not the optimal way from a communication standpoint um, in order to, to run that code. And this uh, two-dimensional algorithm, as we call it, which divides up the iteration space in two dimension, it turns out to be better both in theory and in practice. And it's better in theory because you're reducing the number of uh, messages by the number of copies uh, that you're making of these uh, of the um, data, and you're also um, reducing the volume sent by, by a single factor C. And so this, this other solution has, in some sense, the, the processors uh, divided into groups, and each one of them will be responsible for a certain su subset of the interactions. And once those computations are done, there's a reduction at the end that will um, give you the final answer that is all of the interactions across all of the particles. So it's sort of a replicate, um, compute, and then reduce algorithm. Um, so we, so what happens when we're doing, what is the, the generalized version of this that comes up in genomics? There's actually multiple versions of this, but one of them is to say, um, I want to, I've got a set of strings, a bunch of reads, for example, that came out of a sequencer. I want to overlap them, run an alignment algorithm. The alignment algorithm itself is order n squared, worst case in the length of those strings. We have a bunch of heuristics for cutting that off in practice, but it's nevertheless very expensive in practice. Um, so you don't want to align everything to everything. What you want to do is to align everything that has a common subsequence um, with, with uh, only things that have at least one common kamer. 
And so we basically filter out the pairs by looking at those that by filtering out those that don't have a common k-mer. So we can do that by starting with our hash table, and we can find all of the pairs of input values that have a common uh, a common k-mer from this hash table where we're hashing based on the um, on the uh, we're going to hash based on the k-mers, and um, we can but we can actually view that as a sparse matrix and multiply it times itself. And then we've got our keys across the top here are these these k-mers, and we then when we multiply it times itself, we actually get out the pairs of things that are um, that have a common k-mer within them. And so that's the sort of linear algebra based approach with um, where we're using linear algebra operations um, with generalized semi rings. So not just multiply and add. And here's some performance numbers. I won't go through it in detail, except to say that the, the this is running time. So lower is better. And the original algorithm, the 1D decomposition, which looked like that first set of balls and bins that I talked about or with it with the eight processors with two each. Um, that's the one dimensional algorithm and the two dimensional algorithm. And this is a sparse interaction, though, pattern that we've got here is significantly faster. Um, I think that I'm, I'm going to skip in the interest of time the um, looking at um, some of these other algorithms. Uh, the last example I was going to give, though, comes up in graph neural net training. And I'll just say that it also turns into sparse matrix algorithms and also uses um, things like communication avoiding algorithms, that is dividing up the iteration space of the uh, computation rather than um, just dividing up the, um, the matrices. So the you know, traditional, even dense matrix multiply, the easiest way to think about parallelizing that is taking the, the result matrix, the C matrix, and we can look at, this is the whole iteration space here, the three-dimensional iteration space, and dividing that C matrix up into P chunks. So often say square root of P by square root of P chunks, and giving each one of those processors then a column inside of that iteration space that is responsible for computing. And the nice thing about that is there's only one processor updating any of the, the C values, so there's no issue of race conditions. There's nothing that has to be combined at the end. But as in the end body case, that's not the optimal thing to do. Um, what's, what's actually optimal is to divide it up into cubes and give each processor instead, say, say divide it up into cube root of P by cube root of P by cube root of P, and then um, use do the have each processor do the computation inside of its cube. Uh, of the iteration space. And then at the end, you do need to do a reduction, um, a vertical reduction in order to get the, the final answer, C, I, K, J. And um, we use this also in graph neural nets um, in order to get faster sparse matrix algorithms for both sparse um, sparse sparse matrix multiply, but also sparse dense matrix multiply. Often you're, you're multiplying a sparse matrix times a set of dense vectors, which turns into a, a kind of a, a tall, skinny um, matrix multiply. So, and these are some of the, the um, performance results. But the, the kind of high level point is that you want to explore this space of dividing up the iteration space rather than just the, the data structures that you're computing on. So I'm going to end with more of a, a little bit of um, kind of philosophical and maybe political discussion about where we should be doing this. Um, I was on a panel earlier this week actually on talking about HPC versus cloud, and the general consensus of the panel was that they're not really competing with each other; they're really complementary to each other. But um, there is a um, there there are different communities that have been unfortunately I think quite separate in on the scientific computing side with high performance computing predominantly for modeling and simulation. Um, they've been using supercomputers, both NSF center computers, as well as um, DOE supercomputers and perhaps clusters at, um, in your own, um, I think maybe there's one in the, um, in the area, regional supercomputer center or a university wide cluster, things like that. And on the other hand has been the AI community, which sort of started from smaller scale computational problems and has grown with, um, as their computational problems has grown. I think Rick Stevens at Argonne recently estimated that the alpha fold computation uh, required about $5 million. So that is not something that an individual PI is going to be able to afford to do. And um, I think it's something that we, we and the research community really needs to, to um, take into consideration, the broader um, and the funding agencies as well. And of course, um, the funding agencies have taken that into consideration and uh, the um, administration, the Biden administration has launched this National Artificial Intelligence Research Resource Task Force looking at where should the computations for AI um, be done, so AI broadly. And um, I'll just mention anecdotally that I was at a, on a, 
um, another uh, workshop a, a couple a few years ago with a group of computer science faculty uh, looking at uh, talking about where they where they should do their computation and worrying about cloud computing uh, versus uh, you know running their own and things like that and what was interesting to me was observing that over my career, uh, computer scientists have typically not needed very much computing. As an HPC person, I was one of the few people that had been all, always using high-performance parallel machines, but most of the use of HPC systems has been um, from the other science domains, from material science and chemistry and physics and biology and so on, and, that, and not so much um, in the computer science. And so this is now the time when the computer science community suddenly needs a lot of computing infrastructure, and, um, and they're struggling to figure out how, to, how the agencies should provide that to the research community. And I'll just say we, um, with one of my uh, grad students um, and along with, in collaboration with Aiden Bulich, we've been looking at, and David Kolarex was involved in this too, we were looking at comparing the performance of cloud and HPC systems. We looked at this um, 10 years ago when I was nurse director. And at that point, there was a pretty big gap between the performance that you could get on a cloud. It was much slower than the performance that you could get on an HPC system. Today, that really has changed. And that's changed because you can get HPC instances in the cloud. And that's driven by the fact that there are people that are training machine learning models and using algorithms that um, do span multiple nodes. So the multi-node performance is now more important for, um, for a commercial interesting application, not just for the science community. And so now you can get these HPC instances. So this is looking at network performance, which is very comparable between Cori, which is an HPC system at NERSC, and these two different cloud platforms. And even from the application level, um, and I won't read through the bars here until I can take a couple of questions, but the, the, um, the, the HPC systems are these darker columns and the um, cloud systems are the lighter ones. And you can see even in terms of running time, the cloud systems are sometimes faster. They have more recent hardware in them or whatever. We tried to pick platform pit instances that were as close to the, um, to the HPC systems as we could, but nevertheless, there are differences. And so when you look at the differences between um, the cloud and HPC platforms and the, the trade-offs, um, the first one that, that I think is important to understand in terms you, of the, the cost is the, um, is the utilization of those systems. So a private cl a cluster is often used at about 30% utilization. An HPC system, we run them over 90% utilization. A cloud, they're very private about exactly what their utilization is, but it's typically, I think, around 50% or even a little lower than that. And that's so that you can get the advantage that you've got in the second line, which is elasticity and, um, and low wait times, right? So the science community is forced to wait for their jobs to run an HPC system because in some sense the agencies have said you have to run those HPC systems systems at close to 100% utilization. And that leads to very different costs of those systems where the HPC systems are actually more cost effective because they're fully utilized. You can amortize it over more people. The cost of system administrators, um, there's a somewhat maybe an advantage in a public cloud because of their scale, but the HPC systems are also quite large. The real disadvantage is running private clusters. Um, the cost of power, you can see a little bit of an advantage. On the other hand, you don't get scientific consultant expertise in a cloud. And, um, but then the last one I'll just emphasize here is the profit, um, where of course we're really, if we entirely use um, in, use uh, commercial offerings and don't have any competition from some kind of a, say, private cloud or HPC system that is being run, developed and run just for the scientific community, I'm worried that we're kind of at the mercy of the pricing models of the, uh, of the cloud providers. And so with that, I will just end with one other slide that says, um, you know, we, we worried, I've talked a little bit about the trends in hardware. And of course, the next trend we're worrying about is the end of Moore's law itself, um, having passed the Denard scaling one, which led to more parallelism. And uh, I think that we've, I've spent many meetings over my career trying to get people to think about what they would do with a computer system that's a um, hundred times or a thousand times faster than the one they have today. Um, now I think it's actually very hard for people and, and I include in this the AI community who it's sort of easy to think about new problems that you can solve or new techniques that you can solve with even larger data sets such as the things that I talked about today. Um, and if we really can't get more performance out of these systems, um, it's gonna be hard for us to think about the fact that we, um, we may just need clever algorithms as opposed to um, 
as opposed to uh, faster computers. So with that, I think I'm really close to probably don't have too much time, but I'm happy to take some questions if people want to stay around. Thank you very much, Kathy. This was a fantastic talk. Uh, we are indebted for inaugurating this series with, with your talk. And uh, I, I promise that we will do the point. Uh, but in the meantime, I'd like to open the floor and uh, for people that may have questions. I see that there is a, a couple of questions on uh, quantum computing. Uh, there is a question from Reiser. Uh, Cherminsky that I will convey. And the question is, when do you think quantum computing will make impact in HPC space? You know, I think that it's um, the, the kind of the next big thing. I mean, we've certainly, you know, I, I'm, I don't work in quantum computing myself, but I certainly in my lab um, management roles, I was um, a strong advocate for it and continue to be uh, at um, on the Berkeley campus. I think that, um, you know, we've had these quantum supremacy results. Maybe we don't like that. People don't like that term, but, you know, those are, I, I would call that a, only, a problem only a quantum computer can love. But um, I think the next big breakthrough is going to be a problem of scientific interest that can be done faster on a quantum computer. And I think we will see something like that. I'm not, I'm not sure I'm willing to put a, an exact time frame on it. I'm not enough of a quantum computing expert, but let's say in my lifetime. <laughs> so, um, it, you know, in the next, uh, I don't know, but, um, but I think that uh, we, I think we will see some interesting problems, say in chemistry, uh, high energy physics, material science, um, in um, in quantum computing. And the um, the supercomputing centers are already looking at and already have either partnerships with companies that are designing quantum computers. Or at Berkeley Lab, we actually have a quantum testbed program, which is kind of like a, a mini supercomputer sort of model where we we can't support thousands of users, but you know a half a dozen users a year can come in and, and we can actually reconfigure that hardware, which is, I think, one of the advantages over, say, the, com the commercial offerings of a quantum device that are really pretty rigid. Um, and so I think there's just a lot of exploration still to be done. And so I think in the meantime, it's gonna be a little bit more hands-on, more like an experimental facility, but we'll transition into supercomputing sort of facilities, I don't know, hopefully within 10 years, but um, maybe maybe 20, if not. Thank you. Um, I see there is another question by George Papamokos. George, maybe, maybe our people could actually um, turn on their mic and pose the question themselves instead of me reading it. Uh, hello, thank you very much for uh, your presentation. I would like to ask, I'm a computational chemist and uh, I know that uh, machine learning has been applied to organic synthesis successfully. Also, I know that uh, it has been applied in drug design, but until now, no, no new drug has been synthesized based on machine learning. Uh, one more complicated, let's say complex problem is, uh, for example, cell signaling mechanisms. Do you know if machine learning has been applied successfully in, cells, in analyzing, analyzing uh, mechanisms in uh, cell signaling? No, I, I actually don't know of, um, you know, success cases there of machine learning. I, I mean, I do know people are working on it, but, um, but I have not seen um, any, you know, examples of success. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, in that particular space. So, sorry. Another question from uh, John Sopka. John, please. I will read it. Uh, so, John Sopka is asking, can machine learning really be scientifically interesting? before it is possible to understand the rules of structure of the method producing the outputs? Thank you. The, the question really is about the okay. lack of transparency in how the output is generated. You know, this was a this was a big concern of ours a few years ago when we started looking at machine learning at um, in, in various scientific problems. And, you know, I think there's just a lot of um, scientific sort of skepticism around that, which, which, by the way, I think is very healthy for the machine learning field to have people looking at these things um, from a scientific perspective in terms of what confidence can we um, get out of them? Or do, can we get some kind of uh, provable confidence, even if we don't, um, you know, 
the understanding the methods, I agree, there's still a, a, a black box aspect to, to many of the methods that are the most powerful ones in practice today, um, such as, you know, convolutional neural nets and, and other sorts of models like that. So, but, you know, there's certainly spaces in which I think they're absolutely still valuable. Um, and those are, those include things like figuring out, um, you know, which simulations to run or which experiments to do, figuring out, you um, uh, um, let's see, in analyzing some of the data where you're, um, you're, for example, going to narrow down the set of materials that you want to go into a lab and fabricate. So it's being used to accelerate something, but it's not being used as the, the definitive answer in that case. I think that, um, you know, if they work in practice, as in some other, you know, non-science domains, I think it's still very useful. Um, when you get to the question of, are you going to trust a machine learning algorithm to give you a new mechanistic model of something, then I think you really want better interpretability, some way of explaining, you know, what the model has done that, so that, you, can, that, that you can rely on it for, for that. Um, there's another question by Bill Bloomberg uh, here, Bill. Yes, thank you very much for a marvelous talk. My question is, any comments on applications of your methods of supercomputing to the analysis of very large scale astronomy data sets, such as the ones collected by you know, very large aperture telescopes operated with huge uh, CCD arrays? Right. So, um, well, there's 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 a couple of different pieces of that, and we've actually run for many years. I mean, even when I was nurse director um, back in 2010 or so, um, we're running some machine learning pipelines uh, or doing real time analysis on HPC. Um, systems of the data that was streaming from the telescopes every night. And um, actually, one of the things we've looked at recently is how to make that more resilient. One of the trade-offs I didn't talk about for the cloud versus HPC is the HPC systems do go down. Um, they're not part of this kind of interconnected, automatically resilient network. And so they they redirect those sometimes to other, other um, cloud platforms or other clusters. And so I think that's a really necessary part of that um, for kind of any kind of real-time data processing. I think the... Um, uh, they, they are using machine learning algorithms. This is for things like detecting supernova um, and in the images. And so those are, that machine learning is now part of that standard pipeline that's being used in those astronomy data sets. Um, I think for some of the even larger ones, what, when I, I showed that one picture of the kind of the circle with, um, you know, edge computing and, and experiments on the one hand and the supercomputers on the other hand, um, I think you know what, since I was also overseeing the wide area network for DOE, what we were trying to understand is how do you optimize the whole system? Do you have to put some of the computation for some of these very large scale astronomy experiments like the SKA or something next to the um, next to the devices themselves because you can't afford to send the data, but you should look at it as a global optimization problem. That is where's the most, it's most effective to do your most efficient and most cost effective to do your computation in a centralized resource if you can afford to get the data there. But if you can't afford to get the data there, then you are forced into putting some computation at the edge, if you will. And we're seeing that all around. Um, we work with um, Slack, the the DOE lab that's at Stanford, and they stream some of their most their largest data sets. These are not astronomy ones, although I think the, the some of the astronomy ones are also going to be doing that um, to the to the NERSS Supercomputing Center, and um, and they they have bandwidth reservations and things like that in order to make that happen. But um, at least that that is the plan. But um, for some of their really data intensive experiments, but there 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 is some need for computing that's on the uh, that's closer to the edge in many of these cases, or at least data you know storage for buffering and things like that. So, but I, I will have to say also that scientists often will claim they need the computing right next to them because they want to control it, and that that's a very understandable desire because it means you control the scheduling, you can kind of control the downtime other than when things just go out. But it's that's different than saying it's the, the right thing to do kind of globally for the science community. So I think we should try to look at this from a non uh, kind of from a more objective perspective. Kathy, I'd like to ask a question also myself uh, before our time runs out. Uh, so you have been one of the people that I have has tried to create bridges and interfaces between um, numerical analysis and and data science and or scientific computing and data science in learning communities and I've seen it in several of the slides that you showed that you showed that perhaps sometimes we are talking about the same thing. 
Uh, but besides uh, the, the scientific basis, what is the best way to try to bring these two domains together? What, what is your opinion? Are there common problems, for example, that would require a 50-50 expertise? Um, are there other ways? Um, is there like a big vision as to how it can be solved by data science alone or by large-scale simulation alone? Do you have some suggestions or ideas on this topic? Well, I, I mean, I think there, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, it was the most difficult group at the lab to get on board with the idea that we were, as a lab, going to invest, we put some seed funding into machine learning, was the applied math group, right? Because they were the ones that questioned the validity of the answers that were coming out of machine learning techniques. Now, then I had somebody like Jamie Sethian, who's running a center for, for data analysis, you know, the center, the camera center, for data analysis for the data coming from these large experimental facilities, such as um, the the light source, uh, uh, the advanced light source, and so on, and um, and you know I think he started realizing that there were cases where deep learning techniques, sometimes with his own methods, sometimes with existing ones, were actually very powerful and and useful. So I think you do have to get some of those um, scientific leaders together. I, the other thing that we see happening, frankly, is um, the junior people that we hire are all very interested in and often trained in machine learning. And, um, and so I think uh, collaborations and collaborative teams that um, combine those, you know, different researchers of different level of seniority can be really valuable. I, I'm not sure that that's not really a technical solution. I think you, you know, there's a very legitimate question about how do we get, how do we get better confidence in the methods and how do we combine um, you know, where are there cases when we can learn models, for example, subgrid models or something in a simulation that we don't we don't already have a first principle set of equations for? Um, I, I think I'll leave that to you as an applied mathematician, but uh, it, it, they're very, it, very interesting problems and I think very exciting. I think we, uh, we took a great advantage of your time. We are, uh, again, extremely thankful that you gave this talk and we hope to see you in person in Boston soon and we will work I, on that. I hope so too. All right. Thanks very much. All right. Bye. Thank you. Have a great day, Kat. Bye-bye.